welcome back to the Museum Road Show. Today we're visiting with Alex Shar as he shares more memories of his experiences in World War II with his B-24 bomber crew. I was at Denver in El Paso, Texas, Roswell, New Mexico, Laredo, Texas, and then the crews formed at El Paso, Texas. That's where we, they put their names up on the bulletin board and we met in the hall and uh, they, we met, had a table that we sat down and introduced one another. I'll never forget our, our navigator. He was a kind of a farm guy and he was eating an orange and he broke it in half and he said, you want a half an orange? And he said, <laughs> And that was his nature. He would give you anything. He was he was an officer. He was, but he never showed his his authority at all. He was just a good old guy. We was on fire one time. We got hit over the Anzio beachhead, and uh, our plane was hit. And uh, we had one motor on fire, and we lost our formation, and we got lost coming home. And the pilot says to Oswald, the, bombard, or the navigator, where are we? He says, I don't know, I've been sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> the pilot says, sleeping when we're on fire? He said. <laughs> uh, we, were, we left uh, Denver, Colorado for Laredo on a troop train. And about midnight, we was out of Oklahoma City and our, our troop train was crowded, but I had an empty seat by me. And the train stopped for just a minute in Oklahoma City and then started out again. And down the aisle comes a, a rather unattractive woman. And I thought, oh boy, is she going to sit with me? <laughs> and she did. <laughs> Her first words to me, my name is Eleanor Roosevelt. My my husband is your president, and he wants me to tell you how much we appreciate you guys. And she visited with me for a good, oh, I'd say 20 minutes. And when she left, I thought she was the prettiest doggone woman i ever seen in my life. <laughs> she was a remarkable person, remarkable. And he said, oh, I just can't go on. Of the 10 men of us, only one person was injured, he lost this finger. He was taking a picture like this, and a piece of shrapnel come through and took his finger right off like a surgeon would take it off. And that was our bombardier that lost it, and he was kind of a, a goof off anyhow. And we said, <laughs> <laughs> we, we said, just Ed, you lucky bugger. That finger would have got you in trouble in, in, in uh, St. Paul when you got home and now you don't have to worry no more. <laughs> I was a real old man. I was 21 years old. <laughs> One of the oldest on our crew. We had some that were 20, we had some that were 19, and we had some that was 18. And our little tail gunner, Jimmy Newcomb, showed up late for making the crew, and when he showed up, he looked like he was 14 years old, well-dressed, good-looking kid. And he said, I'm Jimmy Newcomb, I'm your tail gunner. And the pilot says to me, boy, he says, we're going to have to babysit that kid. He said, <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out that Jimmy saved our lives. He was riding along in the, in the um, vapor trail. And Jimmy spotted a, a German 109 coming through the there, and he shot without asking any questions. He just let him have it. And the guy had to drop down. He, he destroyed his uh, oxygen. He didn't l shoot the plane down, but he had to get out of there. And when we get down on the ground, I said to the pilot, I said, this is the kid that we were going to babysit. <laughs> Um, Jerry was a, um, a half-breed native Indian, and he was small. His name was Little, and he was Little. And that ball turret underneath the airplane was the worst spot in the world to sit. It was, 
you raised it up to get in, and then they lowered it, and you were sitting down there all by yourself. And we took a hit right close to the plane, and the concussion was so great, the, the turret come up into the plane and then settled back. And when it settled back, <coughs> it broke the hydraulic hoses, the hydraulic hoses, and he was marooned down there. So the pilot, the intercom was okay, we could talk to him. And the pilot uh, sent me and another guy back to try to crank, there was a, a manual way to get him up. And we got him up halfway and the thing stuck. It uh, bent the tracks. And I looked over and here laid a 36 inch crowbar that the night crew evidently had <laughs> forgotten. And with that crowbar, we straightened the track and got him cranked up. When we got back, why, the guy interrogating us, a, a lieutenant colonel, said, Jerry, when you come down, couldn't you move anything? And Jerry said, the only thing that moved was my bowels. <laughs> One other thing in the drama of that is that the B-24s, they rationed the gasoline. They had just enough gasoline to get to their bomb mission and get back. And they, they were running out of gasoline. And so they, he had to get, get the, the turret up because they couldn't land. Couldn't turret. land with that down. No. When they when they landed, they had no gasoline. Everything said empty. Everything empty. Another miracle. Uh, the bombardier, when he lost his finger, they turned it over to me. That I had switches up in my turret, up in the nose, that I could drop the bombs. Uh, two switches, one to open the bomb bay door, and the other switch to drop the bombs. And they called me a toggleer. <laughs> and for about three missions, I was the the bombardier, and what a thrill that was to drop those bombs and holler bombs away. <laughs> yeah, I was really I was really enthusiastic in, that I could do that. I didn't have to use a, a bomb sight or nothing. We dropped on a smoke bomb that the lead plane would drop the bomb the smoke bomb and then we would drive or fly up to that bomb and then drop on on the smoke bomb so uh there was nothing really important that i'd done except to hit two switches <laughs> i'm the only living one that remained and they all died an unnatural normal death here in the states how old are you right now I'm going to be 95 on November 20th, and you can send the presents uh, to... <laughs> <laughs>